Does it seem like you're being challenged by behaviors in your preschool classroom more so now than ever before? Are your kids bouncing off the walls? Listen, it's no secret that early childhood teachers everywhere have noticed changes in behaviors since the pandemic began. And in this episode of Elevating Early Childhood, we'll be looking at one simple change that you can make in your classroom to reduce these behaviors before they even start. Be sure to listen to the very end so you can get access to the tools you need to make it happen in your classroom today. But first, I want to share my own personal story that led me to record this episode. You see, when I was a brand new teacher, I thought we were all supposed to use bright primary colors in our classroom, right? I mean, basic color theory that was popular at the time said yellow makes you happy, red stimulates conversation, and orange can make you hungry, which is what led many fast food restaurants to create their logos using those colors. Think about it for a minute, right? The consensus at the time seemed to be that bright colors are what make us happy and white is considered sterile and boring. Then gradually over time, I started to change my mindset around using colors in the classroom. You see, A few things happened. The first one was a colleague stepped into my classroom one day and then she quickly stepped out. And when I asked her what was wrong, she said that the colors in my classroom were giving her a headache. Now, at first I just dismissed this as an isolated incident, but it planted, I think, a very tiny little seed in the back of my mind. The next thing that happened had to do with my bulletin boards. You see, I detest changing out bulletin boards every month. I can't stand it. So one day I decided that I would cover all the bulletin boards in my room with black bed sheets, flat black bed sheets. And that was what would remain up all year. And I chose bed sheets because they don't fade, right? So they're not going to fade just like the uh, bulletin board paper that you put up every month fades if you leave it up longer than a month and it starts to look dingy and drab after a couple of months, right? So then I put up the exact same border on every single board. So all I had to do was change out student work every month. And that was much, much easier. And also I was going broke buying hashtag all the borders, right? And when I made this one very simple shift, I noticed that me, the teacher, right, felt more calm in the classroom than ever before. And I started to wonder if maybe it would have the same effect on the children. So after that experience, I decided to switch out all the bins in my classroom. You know, those really bright primary red, yellow, blue, and green bins that you see in every early childhood classroom seemingly in the world? Yep, those bins. I changed them out for clear bins. Mostly because I noticed that when I used clear bins in the classroom, I had a few, um, that the kids played with those materials and interacted with them more so than when they were in the primary colored bins, which they couldn't see through. So that was my initial motivation with that. And when I swapped them out, I noticed a huge difference in my classroom right away with a decrease in noise and behavior. So now I had my bulletin boards and my bins that had been changed, right? And eventually I moved to a solid light green, almost like a seafoam classroom rug instead of one of those rugs from commercial places. You know, the ones I'm talking about, they all have a blue background and then they have really bright like alphabet stuff all over. And those always gave me a headache and made me dizzy when I looked at them. It's just way too much overstimulation. And at that point, I knew enough to know that if it was making me feel that way, how must it make the children feel? So I swapped my classroom rug out for a nice, solid, kind of a lighter, neutral tone. And that made a big impact. My point in telling you all of this is to show you that you don't have to feel bad or guilty if you've ever used lots of bright colors in the classroom because the change in my own classroom was very gradual, right? Now, I also don't want you to think that I am telling you to throw out everything in your classroom and start from scratch because you and I both know that if you're in a public school, you decorate your classroom using your own money and teachers don't have very much of that, right? And if you're wondering if I can show you these changes that I've made, then you need to keep watching until the very end because I've got something that I think you'll love.
And for our listeners, you might want to check out the video for this episode. So now that you know where my motivation for this episode came from, here are three early childhood facts to help you reframe your thinking on this topic. Fact number one, most young children have short attention spans and they're easily distracted. Would you agree? Fact number two, The ability to self-regulate, that means to control your own impulses and feelings, is not fully formed in humans until the age of 20 or older. Wow, that was shocking, right? Fact number three. When a young child becomes overstimulated, they can act out. So some may have difficulty paying attention and focusing when they're visually overstimulated, and others may become overstimulated by a noisy environment. And when children are overstimulated and overwhelmed, they're more likely to become aggressive, disruptive, running around the classroom, or even cry. And fact number four. There is an entire body of research that points to the classroom environment as a factor that can contribute to overstimulation. And now we're going to look at ways that you can help the young children in your classroom focus more and begin to self-regulate by decreasing those opportunities for overstimulation. First, let's talk about color. Remember that color theory that I mentioned earlier where it said that different colors can make you feel different ways? It also used to be thought that young children seemed to be attracted to bright, bold colors, and therefore the environments that they were in, whether that was in the classroom or in their bedrooms at home, they needed to be bright, bold, primary colored too. And this theory was based in the idea that children need sensory stimuli, right, during early stages of development. And don't get me wrong, they do. But using bright, bold colors in the classroom environment is a a big oversimplification of this idea, right? Instead, we now know that bright colors can compete for children's attention and visually bombard them which can result in this overstimulation when we know that overstimulated kids can act out, right? In fact, young children are more likely to experience the negative effects of visual overstimulation than we as adults do. One scientific study even showed that children achieved lower overall assessment scores in heavily decorated classrooms, whatever that means, compared to children in more sparsely decorated classrooms. So that was pretty shocking too, right? Now today, we've become much more aware about using the classroom environment to help promote mental health and well-being in young children and teachers too, right? Personally, I think we could all use a little improvement to our mental health and (laughs) well-being. But truly, what I believe is that when we know better, we do better, right? So what does this all mean for you in your classroom? It just means we should carefully consider the colors that we're using in the classroom environment, not just the paint choices, because quite often, to be honest, you and I both know that teachers often don't have any say in the colors that are on their classroom walls. That comes from the administration typically. So for example, instead of putting up lots of brightly colored like alphabet, color, shape, and number posters, instead you could reduce the number of things that you have on your wall and try to feature more natural earth tones in the things that you do have on the wall so they don't overstimulate your students. And this concept even extends to the floors, like we talked about with the carpets. Next, we're going to talk about lights. Yes, those lights, the lights you turn on and off in your classroom. Have you ever come home from a long day of teaching and noticed that your eyes felt fatigued? They were tired? It turns out that your eyes may be tired because of the fluorescent lights you may have in your classroom. You see, bright fluorescent lights can affect our mood and our behavior of both the teacher and the children. So what can you do about the lighting in your classroom? You can't teach in the dark, right? So if you have windows in your classroom, take advantage of as much natural light as you can. And there are also these really cool uh, diffusers that can attach with magnets to the fluorescent lights in most schools, right? They diffuse the light, they make it less harsh. 
Another way you can tone down the lights in your classroom is to use more lamps and things like twinkle lights to light your room instead of the fluorescence if you're allowed to do so. Not all programs will allow you to do this due to strict fire codes or some licensing programs don't allow it because of the electrical outlets and the cords and the safety hazards they may pose. So lighting can be tricky if you are in one of those situations. And next, let's turn our attention to natural elements. There is no question at all that young children spend less time outdoors today than they ever have in the past. And they're spending much more time indoors and on electronic devices, right? And this lack of time spent outside and the increase in screen time can actually stunt the crucial social emotional development of skills like empathy. Yes, you heard me right. It can also negatively impact their gross and fine motor skill development because their muscles in their bodies aren't getting the exercise necessary for healthy development. Eek. Nature can help counterbalance the negative effects of too much screen time. Bringing the outdoors into the classroom environment is beneficial for all children, but it's especially beneficial for children who live in urban areas where they may not have as much access to the outdoors. So what can you do in your classroom? First things first, I'd start simple and go with the bulletin boards, right? That's an easy place to start. Just try toning down the colors you use in your bulletin boards, not the children's work. The children's work is what brings the color into the classroom, but I'm talking about the backgrounds and the borders. And then the next thing you can do that's really easy is to not put anything on the walls above the child's eye level right? Because that's what creates visual clutter. The next thing you can do that's really easy is to bring plants into your classroom because they've been shown to promote feelings of happiness. The next thing you can do is start incorporating natural materials into the classroom for the children to use. Some things that come to mind are like sticks, rocks, shells, um, wood slices, and pine cones. All of these can be placed into your classroom for either exploration, uh, for science, and they can specifically be used in the math center for math skills as well. The next one I really like, and I think it makes a big difference because I have one um, in my home that I really like. It's a small tabletop water fountain, like a water feature. Um, research has shown that this also, the, the sound of water can be very calming for some children. Now the tabletop one is really small, uh, but it's just something you can do that's going to add a little bit more of a natural element. And of course, using natural baskets whenever possible. Um, I still use the clear bins because I also believe that children interact more with materials they can see. So that's kind of one place where I haven't given in. I still have plastic bins, but they're clear. So I made that compromise. A salt lamp is another really good thing to bring into the classroom because that's a, another way to get light, but it's also a natural element too, right? And finally, things like class pets. Now I know not everyone can have a class pet for various reasons, but if you, if you can, it's always a really good thing because it's a natural element. It helps children create a sense of empathy with animals. Um, and if you're not allowed to have a class pet, then taking field trips to places like the zoo, the farm, the aquarium, these are all great things that you can do to give your children access to more um, nature. Two more things, things like those LED candles that um, look like real flickering flames. Now, caveat, you wanna put these out of the children's reach because we know they use little batteries and those aren't safe, but those little LED candles, you can get them at a lot of places now. Those would be great for lighting. And then of course, the big one, which is the outdoor garden. That's kind of a big commitment, but if you can, that's another great way to get children to interact with nature in a real hands-on way. So the research clearly supports bringing nature into the classroom because it can help us experience less stress, become more productive, and increase creativity. These all sound like big wins in my book. So here are some objections though, because I know that a lot of people don't like to hear this because it goes against everything they've ever known or been taught. So here are some of those objections that I've heard from teachers who are not ready to give up their colorful classrooms just yet. Objection number one, 
this is just a trend. We're going to see the pendulum swing back to rainbows soon enough. Well, my response to that is probably not, in my opinion, because more and more schools are implementing these ideas, campus and even district-wide. Even large school supply companies like Lakeshore, Discount School Supply, they're creating things for this market. That's a big commitment. My prediction is that very soon we'll begin to see things like colors, light, and natural elements start to become part of rating systems, such as the one with all the letters, rhymes with Becker's. Objection number two. I decorate my classroom the way I want because it's my personal preference and I spend a lot of time there. So, wow, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack with this one, but I just noticed how many times um, this objector said I and my. So I get it. I really, really get it because I used to think this exact same way. But as professional educators, we have to keep things in perspective and we have to shift our mindset from the classroom being the teacher's kingdom when in fact the classroom actually belongs to the children. We're just the facilitators or the guides. The bottom line is that we're there to help children learn. Now, adhering to these principles that I'm talking about in this episode does not mean that you have to dress in neutral colors, my goodness, no, or you can't have pops of color in the classroom. All of that still works just fine. Instead, think of it as the children bringing the color into the classroom through their drawing and their art. Nobody's talking about taking away their crayons and paint. In objection number three, I don't like neutral colors. They don't make me happy. See, answer to number two, I and me, remember. <laughs> Here's the bottom line. All of this isn't a magic pill. The relationships you have with your students will have a much larger impact on them than the way you decorate your classroom. But every little bit helps, right? Now, if you liked this episode, this is just a tiny piece of the information I'll be sharing in a live webinar with members of our Teaching Trailblazer program. You see, each month we have a live online training, and this month's topic is all about setting up successful centers in the classroom. And do you know what else our Trailblazers have access to? It's my brand new Boho Bundle. This bundle includes resources with more calming neutral colors that you can use to quickly and easily transform your classroom environment using the principles I've outlined for you in this episode. So things that are in this bundle, the first day of school bulletin board, an affirmation station, if you don't have one, you need one, ASL posters, that's American Sign Language, editable meet the teacher templates and a few of these resources are also in Spanish and there's even more in that bundle as well that I didn't list. Now the training is exclusive to Trailblazer members but if you just want the resources you can grab them in my store uh, at the link in the video description or you can search Boho Bundle at Pre-K Pages. Until next time I'm Vanessa Levin onward and upward. If you think these videos are valuable, you have got to come check out the Teaching Trailblazers program. Teaching Trailblazers is the place for teachers like you to get the professional development resources and support you need to thrive. It's where you can learn relevant, life-changing best practices with professional development created specifically around the challenges early childhood teachers face. It's where you can get access to a complete research-based pre-K curriculum that you can use either to supplement your existing curriculum or use on its own to get 100% of your students kindergarten ready by the end of the year. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things early childhood with other teachers just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your teacher life, I guarantee it. Come join us at teachingtrailblazers.com to get more information and apply today. That's teachingtrailblazers.com. I can't wait to see you there.